Welcome, everyone. I am Mahna Yusuf, and I graduated from Harvard Business School in 2016 with a PLDA. I'm also chairing Harvard in Tech Seattle chapter. Harvard in Tech is the official Harvard University-wide alumni group for technology. We hope to further the development of technology through encouraging innovation, providing resources and networks, and promoting technological activity throughout the Harvard community. This webinar is getting recorded and will be available at the Harvard in Tech Seattle webpage. I'll be moderating today's panel discussion about the future of digital assets. We are so honored to have a three distinguished panelists joining us today. Our first guest today is Holger Arians. Holger is a CEO of Bangsa Holdings Inc., a payment services provider for the digital asset industry. Bangsa is listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange Ventures since January 2021 and Frankfurt Bourget since March 2021. Based in Melbourne, Australia, Holger leads a team of professionals with the mission to create a bridge between the traditional financial system and the digital asset world. He co-founded Bangsa in 2014 and has since grown the business to a market capitalization of around 300 million with offices in several countries. Prior to taking the CEO role at Bangsa in January 2019, Holger oversaw a portfolio of early stage technology companies as CEO of Dominant Venture Partners in Melbourne. In 2018, Holger co-founded Apollo Capital, an award-winning multi-strategy digital asset fund managing in excess of 80 million. Before moving to Australia, Holger worked in corporate development for a multinational corporation in the German defense sector. He was part of the corporate finance team that raised uh, 290 million euro for the refinancing of the company in 2011. He has been serving in the German Army Reserve since 2000. Holger was appointed honorary finance judge at the Cologne Finance Court in Germany in 2013. Holger has been an avid investor and advisor to the startup community in Australia and brings a wealth of experience in management, strategy, and fundraising to the ventures he is working with. Holger holds a degree in business administration from Fontes Home School in the Netherlands and executive MBA from both ESSEC Business School in France and Mannheim Business School in Germany. He is a Harvard Business School alumnus and an active member of ABS Global Community, where he has been co-organizing annual leadership summits with Harvard professors and thought leaders around the world. Holger is joining us from Melbourne, Australia. Thank you very much, Mahino. Hi, everyone. Our next speaker is Massimo Buonamo. Massimo is highly regarded professional in the blockchain field. His current focus is on central bank digital currencies, artificial intelligence, alternative data, FinTech, RegTech, and Internet of Things. Massimo was a UN global expert for 10 years until beginning of 2021 in the area of blockchain, cryptocurrencies, CBDCs, AI. Massimo also acts as a board advisor and consultant for international organizations, central bank, and corporates. After working in international financial market for 20 years as senior equity banking analyst, Massimo worked as a university professor of fintech and international finance in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, Turin, Italy, and Wuhan, China. Massimo is a regular keynote speaker and gives interviews to the international press in many international conferences and webinars on CBDCs, blockchain, and AI. Massimo is a senior expert and advisor in fintech blockchain in finance for several international organizations like United Nations Center for Trade Facilitation and Electronic Business in United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, Italy. Massimo lived in Europe, China, US, South America, and is fluent in Italian, English, and Portuguese. So Massimo is joining us from Florence, Italy. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. 
Our next speaker is Torsen Hoffman. Torsen is a serial entrepreneur, advisor, and investor with a focus on technology and media who started as a journalist covering the new economy boom in 1999. As producer and director of the two award-winning documentaries, Bitcoin, The End of Money as We Know It, published in 2015, and Cryptopia, Bitcoin, blockchains and the future of the internet in published in 2020. His insight made it into hundreds of millions of television homes in 40 countries. He is a sought after expert who regularly speaks at technology and finance conference worldwide. He regularly advises financial institutions and high net worth individuals on the latest developments in the blockchain industry and is an angel investor in several startups. He has also been active as a strategy consultant since 2008. Torsen has lived extended periods of his life in the US, Asia, Australia, and Europe. He holds an MBA from Oxford University. Torsen is joining us from London, UK. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. So welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. We are so honored to have you here. Uh, today's panel discussion is about the future of digital assets. I have to say to our audience that this will be a very timely discussion. As you might know, the recent cryptocurrency market's massive crash worsened in Sunday as a wave of crackdown measures in China continues to rattle investor sentiment, pushing losses to more than 1.3 trillion since a market peak on May 12. The day Elon Musk announced on Twitter that Tesla would no longer invest in or sell Bitcoin due to its high environmental cost. The market, which peaked at nearly 2.6 trillion, dropped more than 50% in just 11 days as Bitcoin, Ather, Dogcoin, and Cardano plunged 31%, 47%, 43%, and 50% over the past week, respectively. Analysts are pinning recent losses to investors' fears over strengthening crypto regulation in China, where authorities on Friday pledged to crack down on Bitcoin mining and trading behavior in an effort to resolutely control financial risks. Financial regulators in China issued another notice that helped spark the midweek plunge, telling banks and payments institutions that conducting any business with cryptocurrencies was prohibited and subject to penalization. The most recent announcement of the ban on cryptocurrency services in China stated that Bitcoin is a special a specific virtual commodity that is not issued by a monetary authority, has no monetary properties, such as being legal tender, is not a real currency and should not and cannot be used as currency in the market. This points to a deeper underlying question, who has the right to issue money? It's worth noting that China's claiming is tied to monopoly over the issuance of currency. The fact that China is the first mover in trying to contain this bubble is a reminder that the country is at the forefront of digital currency development. But we have to distinguish between privately mined Bitcoin and China's effort to create a digital one. Whereas the former is largely in line with the idea of a private currency that circumvents the exclusive right of the state to issue money, China's digital renminbi is trying to do the exact opposite. It is state-backed digital currency that would enable consumers to access digital legal tender straight from their bank. So regulatory concerns have rocked the crypto market before. Despite rising more than tenfold in 2017, the combined value of the world's cryptocurrency crashed more than 80% within months after countries like South Korea started cracking down on then booming initial coin offerings, which minted new tokens and filled an investor mania, not unlike the recent surge in relatively unknown altcoins. It wasn't until the pandemic that inflationary concerns and heightened institutional adoption lifted the market to new heights again late last year. 
The market is still up about 50% from its early 2018 peak, but what's to come is still very uncertain. Some experts believe that market is mature enough to recoup its losses, but others are warning that there is still room for a steeper correction. So in today's discussion, we are going to learn more about regulation around cryptocurrency and digital assets, its environmental impact, insight on China's official adoption of cryptocurrency, and its global disruption of all financial players and more. So let's move on to, on, uh, to our panelists, and we will start with the question. This question is um, addressed uh, to the, all the panelists. We'll start with Holger, then move on to Massimo and Torsen. Um, why have you chosen this industry for your career? Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mahino. And, and, and first of all, let me thank you for organizing this. I know how much work you've put into this. Um, that, that's really great. Thanks very much for having us here. And, and hello, everyone. Um, why have I chosen this industry for my career? Um, I mean, what, what you just said sounded like an action movie, um, which other industry really um, has all these ups and downs. And frankly, after last the last couple of weeks where the markets have just seen a bloodbath um, after <laughs> Elon Musk had a few tweets and, and was on Saturday Night Live, um, you know, uh, saying Bitcoin and Dogecoin are the best invention ever. And then the next day um, he says that Tesla is not um, accepting Bitcoin payments anymore. Um, it's it's a roller coaster and it has been. And, and I entered the industry seven years ago. Um, and um, for me, it was just... Um, exploratory we uh, we just wanted to um explore what it is um, we started with bitcoin mining the technology behind it really was interesting um but then over time this just developed to such a big beast um in many many ways it's um it it, it has disruption potential not just for technology the technology is just the underlying um infrastructure which fuels the change um, that that comes with it in terms of um, you know, certainly on the on the financial services front, um, everything we do in traditional finance, we can now do um, digitally, decentralized, peer to peer, um, which is amazing. But we're, we're still a long way um, off that. And then even um, identity management, logistics, voting, um, entertainment. There's so much. If you think of the latest trend, NFTs. So look, for me, this is a generational event. Um, I wasn't really in the right headspace during the dot-com boom, um, which was a generational event. I was still studying and had a good time and traveled. But now it's really, this is just the beginning. Crypto is just over 10 years old. Um, this is just the beginning. It's, um, people say it's where the internet was in 1995. Um, so the best is yet to come. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting deeper into it. Um, over to you. I think Tosin was next. Oh, Massimo, sorry. Yes. Well, first of all, I wanted to thank you for having me here with you. Um, I, I can say that I've always been interested in cutting edge technologies and subjects related to that. This, is, uh, uh, this has always been the driver in my career. As uh, uh, you heard, I worked for about 20 years in international financial markets. I became university professor of fintech, then UN global expert in block, uh, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, fintech. And uh, I, uh, what I, uh, I understood is that uh, there is a convergence of the three main technologies, blockchain, AI, and IoT. And I invented this word blockchain IoT, which is uh, uh, actually the convergence of these technologies. And I always focus on that because I think uh, if you want to be ready for the future, you have to understand today what's going to happen tomorrow. I've uh, always had this international perspective and the same curiosity which spurred me to get into finance decades ago. So I think this is a very exciting time to be in uh, in this sector. And uh, I would encourage uh, all the students, uh, all the entrepreneurs to get into that uh, uh, because uh, what's gonna happen today will decide what's gonna happen in 10 years time. So this is a very exciting time and I'm very excited to, to, to be in it and to advise uh, companies, uh, people, 
even students about these issues. Over to Thank Tosta. Thank you, Massimo. Yeah, um, let me relate this to a few of the um, participants here in this call. So um, everyone who first hears about Bitcoin or cryptocurrency will first think this is a scam. This is somebody's trying to make money off me. This is a Ponzi scheme, right? Or what is this crazy, um, uh, you know, uh, bubble and, cr and crash. And um, for me, uh, when I first heard about it in 2013, um, I just connected the dots a little bit earlier because I had written a paper in university about alternative currencies. So I kind of um, understood the nature of our current financial um, um, system, how money is created and all that. And, and that turned out um, to a little, almost like a master thesis, um, which was my first film, Bitcoin at the End of Money as, as We Know It. That was 2014 and was released in 2015. So that was my, my rabbit hole story. And um, I'm, I'm sure, uh, you know, the, the same is true for everyone. Like first people are skeptic, um, then they get into it and then they really get into it, right? And then understand it. And um, yeah, that's, that's my short story. Thank you, Torsten. So we will move on to our next question. Uh, this question is directed to Holger. So we all heard about Coinbase's listing on NASDAQ a month or so ago. So Holger, you have listed your business as well. Uh, tell us about your journey of building a global company in the crypto space. Yeah, thank you, Mayan. No. Look, um, this is going back to, to 2014 when um, we ordered the first Bitcoin miners uh, from, from China and, and they arrived at our office and um, yeah, we just plugged them in and started mining Bitcoin and um, you know, they were coming in and um, it, was, it was very interesting. Um, the whole office building, we just rented one floor, um, had a few power outages because um, it was winter, uh, summer in Australia. Um, the air conditionings were um, were going, and um, yeah, we we had very angry neighbors um, in the building because the the Bitcoin miners were just um, sucking in so much energy. Um, so it was just interesting to to learn by doing, I guess. Um, and so we we founded a company around there because we thought um, getting your hands on Bitcoin is still difficult, um, especially in Australia at that time, that's 2014. So it, it was much more of a black box than it is today. Um, so we, we went with that um, for some time um, and then um, slowly it, it really took off and people were getting more interested. They, they um, bought fractions of Bitcoins or at that time you could still buy a whole Bitcoin. It was around $200. Um, now that's much more difficult. Um, and um, build a team around that. Um, I was always involved from an investor side. So I co-founded the business. I looked after other uh, startups as well at that time. We always had uh, people in the business running it, managing it. Um, and um, I think what, what was really hard was the acceptance of what we were doing because um, all these negative stories um, about, about the, the dark net and, and, you know, the uh, crime um, that's been pretty much translated from the real world into the crypto world and everyone thought they were safe um, but it's actually the opposite it's much more traceable um, uh, all that has been a big big challenge for us um, I mean this is a whole new industry we're not just doing a startup and I, I know how startups work and how long it takes for them to really get traction and what the headwinds are but a new industry that is disrupting you know, one of the biggest industry financial services um, is just an additional challenge. And we've seen that when um, we were debanked by um, all of Australia's banks, they debanked us, uh, they closed, they froze our, our funds um, and closed more than 50 bank accounts over, you know, three, four years. Um, I'm personally blacklisted with a couple of the major banks. Um, some I'm still some some I never open an account with so that I can get a mortgage one day. Um, wow. But the reality is, um, you know, the banks say they they cannot control the risk, and that's why they just without even notice they just close your account the moment they find out that you're a cryptocurrency business. And that might be you know might be a competitive thing where they say. Well, eventually, you know, we don't want to fuel these companies. Eventually, they're going to take business away from us. Those banks are very comfortable. So these challenges are, are new for an industry like that. And, and we had to face that as well and we had to work around it. Um, but that has actually created opportunity for us as well to create alternative payment methods. As an example, we've gone to Australia Post, which has 4,000 branches. We made an exclusive deal with them and said, um, 
how about our customers? If they want to, they can deposit money here because Australia Post has a banking license as well. And you send us the money electronically. Um, because what we wanted is for this technology to be where the people are. It, we wanted to pick up the people in the real world. So it should become as normal as sending a letter at the post office, you can pay for your for your Bitcoin transaction. And maybe just for the first transaction to get you into it, to create that trust, because trust is the biggest problem in this industry, because um, everything is online. So maybe have that first transaction for $100 face to face with a government employee of Australia Post. So we've created that. And um, that was that was um, probably um, the first um, step for us to look beyond the traditional financial system and, and um, work around um, those, those roadblocks. And then back in January 2019, I mean, we've seen the, the um, not bubble burst, but there's been a rally in 2017, which has been crazy. Everyone was talking about crypto and ICOs and, and um, everyone thought they get rich quick and, and that's never the case. Some will get away with it, but it's just not what it is. Um, we were flying high as our business was going extremely well. We were so selling um, a lot of um, cryptocurrency, mostly Bitcoin. But then um, eventually in 2018 is when the first crypto winter sort of took place and um, things came down again. Um, we had built our structure. We thought this is going to go on like this forever. We were very naive at that point. And um, we basically said, um, now we have to do a bit of a turnaround because we're too expensive um internally with our cost structure um and um so i eventually had to step in as as ceo um to take over um the business by then was our biggest portfolio company as well and um i basically um sort of took inventory what do we have what are we really good at because at that time we were doing too many things and um, we had to um, let a few people go, unfortunately, um, and then really see what um, what we can take forward uh, and, and where our strengths are. Um, and for us, there was the payment uh, infrastructure that we created, but also the regulatory um, experience because more and more regulation came in. Australia was one of the first ones to regulate crypto in uh, back in April 2018. So we took all that, we, we rebranded um, the business to what it is today, banks are, um, and we um, also changed the segment where we were selling to, we were then selling to B2C, um, now it's B2B. Um, so you can basically go um, log into your Binance account, Binance is the biggest um, uh, crypto exchange globally, um, and Binance doesn't touch fiat currency themselves. Um, they, they, they sort of do it now, but before, um, I mean, now they're offering credit card, for example, but we have all the different payment methods. So if you want to buy um, cryptocurrency, you get redirected to us inside the Binance platform. Um, and then you can convert your US dollars or Australian dollars to cryptocurrency. We send it directly to your crypto account inside Binance and you can go trade. Why do we do that? Because um, the moment you touch fiat currency, so the US dollar, for example, you're regulated. You have to have the payment rails, you have to have bank accounts, um, you have to, in order to have a bank account, you have to have a local entity, you have to have local directors. So it's hard, it's really hard and, and we deal with that. So that's sort of how, um, I guess, we've um, evolved as a business in this, in this challenging industry. Um, and I might just say one more thing, um, it was even hard to um, justify what I was doing because many of my friends, family, they were all in traditional jobs. Uh, traditional industries not jobs but industries and you know my dad used to send me whenever there was a headline about something in crypto 90 percent was negative and he always sent that to me and it just creates this sort of um notion that crypto might be related to something negative and and mm -hmm. that made it very difficult as well the general perception that i'm in crypto or bitcoin and that's you know something um not so good Made it, made it really difficult. And that was one of the reasons why we also wanted to list our company on the stock exchange because it, it creates this legitimacy. And here again, it took us 12 months. We got pushed back so many times. We have to provide so many legal opinions. Um, we're, we're probably one of the first 50 um, listed um, crypto companies globally. Um, and yeah, we've, we've broken into new territory. And, and today we can say we've, we've succeeded. We've done extremely well, but Really, this is just the next chapter. This space is still um, in its infancy, and, and um, 
we're just starting really so I'm, I'm super excited what's next and hopefully by now people see that um, what we're doing um, is good um, and um, brings a lot of positive change to the world so that that's sort of the story um, that I wanted to share. And thank you, Holger, for uh, sharing such a fascinating story of your journey. Uh, we really appreciate it. So uh, we will move on to the next question. Uh, this is uh, uh, directed to Massimo. Uh, so China, in an unprecedented move, just announced that they are officially adopting a certain cryptocurrency as China's official coin. The sale of China's uh, coin officially started on April 19, 2021. So how is this going to impact the U.S. and global market? Thank you for the question. First, uh, I want to give an introduction on how this uh, fits into the current environment. Uh, what is the uh, Chinese strategy? As we know, uh, the China global strategy at world level focuses on three main points. First, the Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI, which is a global development strategy adopted by the Chinese government involving infrastructure development and investments in 152 countries and international organizations in Asia, Europe, Africa, Middle East, and the Americas. That's the first point. The second point is about international trade. China overtook the US as the world's largest goods trader in 2014. The country has been the leading world exporter for a decade. There is a disconnect, however, between the highest proportion of the world trade going through China and its denomination in US dollars. And that's the crucial question. Why China got into uh, the DCEP, uh, the the digital currency. First of all, uh, this app is digital currency electronic payment. And uh, China is the first country in the world to roll out a digitized domestic currency for the control of digital money supply. The People's Bank of China has an agenda to set the industry standards across the financial sector, including blockchain. But why many countries talk about digital national currency, China is at the forefront of it at world level. Because China wants to get sort of independent or give a, a higher way to its, uh, uh, its currency, the renminbi. Now, the People's Bank of China digital currency main features are, first of all, exactly the same as paper money, but it is just a digital form. Second, to be transferred between users without an account or even without a mobile or internet network. But however, if a user's mobile phone has a wallet, the digital currency can be transferred to another person by placing the two phones in physical contact, the NFC technology. And that is a use not only of blockchain technology, as current technology would not be able to handle transaction volumes in China. So the main features uh, uh, of the uh, DSAP is that central bank will do this uh, DSAP by distributing the, the DSAP to consumer faces, uh, facing firms. And then those firms will then issue it to the public. These firms should include the tech giant uh, payment apps like Alipay, WeChat, along with leading banks. CBDCs would not require a linked bank account. And this is a sort of a horse race in which the leader will win the entire market. That's why the Chinese got into it. Also because there were strong concerns about Libra, which is now called DM, and that's different features. But what are the features of the DCEP, the digital one? The main uh, aim is to maintain control of money supply. This is a feature that uh, happens in China, of course because the digital currency would replace what in economics is called M0 or cash in circulation rather than M2, which would generate credit and impact monetary policy. Also, uh, its use uh, is to cut the cost of circulating traditional paper money. And also digital assets must be put under central bank oversight. Why? To prevent foreign exchange risks. Eventually, to contrast the Libra, 
and the end, which could be becoming a dominant form of digital payment and a channel for money laundering given the social network massive cross-border reach. But there are, all, of course, criticism against uh, this app, which are focused on the fact that uh, this is a centralized cryptocurrency intended to give China more control over its financial system, which is, uh, of course, something that uh, we in the West wouldn't feel very comfortable uh, with. Also, it is a different cryptocurrency from Libra, which will be used in different countries with a different impact. But of course, it is a way of tracking money flows. Every time money changes hands, there is a balance between what the Chinese call controllable anonymity and anti-money laundering, CTF, counter-terrorist financing, and also tax issues. Mm -hmm. This is a, 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 some, an introduction, as you said, that there will be gradual and its impact small in the short term. Therefore, this is uh, something that, uh, of course, is aimed at uh, increasing the weight of the one, the, uh, the one in the world and reduce the weight of the dollar. Because in this way, uh, China feels a bit uncomfortable. We've seen what's happen what happened in uh, Hong Kong recently when there was a sort of prohibition from uh, 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 the uh, Trump administration against the Chinese uh, uh, bank employees that were dealing with the government and so forth. And so China wants to some, some extent become independent and reduce the weight of the uh, US dollar. And this is a sort of a tool to do that. Okay, uh, thank you, Massimo. Um, we will uh, move on uh, to the next question. This is directed to Tarsan. Um, Bitcoin's energy consumption is destroying the environment. Should we be concerned or are there uh, any alternatives? Yeah, that's, that's a tricky question that I've been hearing uh, for many, many years. And this, this um, comes up every news cycle. Um, just quickly on central bank um, issued uh, and digital currencies, uh, the China question, um, like just to simplify for everyone listening, um, what the central banks are doing, whether it's China or the Fed or the um, European Central Bank, and what Bitcoin or Ethereum is, is kind of like almost the opposite the exact opposite because it is not decentralized and it's kind of uh, state controlled. So I, I is very true and uh, what Massimo was saying, um, uh, but it's just important to, to remember they are kind of using some of the same technology, but it's kind of the, the exact opposite um, idea. Like we Bitcoiners and Ethereum people, we want to get everything like in people's hands and away from the government almost. Um, now the question um, regarding the, the energy. So um, this is really almost like a litmus test of how good you understand the space, right? Um, I'm, I'm going to give you a couple answers and it's going to be a increase in sophistication and like a, a level of understanding. So first of all, you, you might say, oh, um, uh, Bitcoin um, uses a lot of energy, but but if you if I use the lift, it's also using more energy than going with the stairs. If I use the car, it uses more energy than using a horse, right? Um, so and, and more technology always um, uh, increases energy usage. Um, but that doesn't really answer it because, you know, is the energy green or not green? That is kind of like the question, right? Um, and um, at the moment, um, um, a lot of studies show that actually the Bitcoin um, um, energy consumption is more green, more sustainable than other sources, um, than, than other um, um, energy mixes in, in countries. Um, in fact, um, you can think of Bitcoin, the perfect means to transfer energy into money. And where do you do that? Where you have the energy closest to the source of energy. Where do you have uh, energy? Very cheap is where you have an excess of energy, free energy. And in a lot of cases, um, in China, for example, these hydro dams, they have too much water in those dams. The rainfalls are coming. They need to kind of release it. And there's no people living in that area. And, and that's and other similar examples. That's where that's why a lot of the Bitcoin um, um, energy um, uh, consumption comes from sustainable sources at the source, which is actually not taking away uh, energy from the market. Also, on a more fundamental level, you can think of energy as being non-fungible because it, it, you, you can't transfer it. You lose a lot of, uh, you know, uh, of it to, to transport it to the city. So um, having that method of, of Bitcoin really makes everything more efficient and, and uh, in real time uh, kind of like. And then finally, we kind of want Bitcoin 
to use more energy. The more energy it uses, the more secure it is. We don't want a, a state or government um, um, actor to be able to attack uh, um, Bitcoin, right? In, in order um, to do that, we need to secure it with a lot of hashing power and uh, energy um, in order to have it safe. So if you have an asset that is a trillion dollars worth and you spend, I don't know, $2 billion per year on energy, that's a pretty good, it's, it's sub 1% kind of um, security um, um, cost to it. Um, and, and finally, maybe now the most philosophical point, just one bullet point. The energy is what ties Bitcoin, the digital currency, to the real world. That's the bridge. That's what we need. And yes, sure, there's other, there are other blockchains that don't consume any energies and they're very useful for many other things. But for digital gold use case, for, 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 for um, you know, securing a trillion dollar asset, you need that. Thank you. Uh, anyone would like to add to it, Holger Massimo? Well, I, I take his point, but I'm a little bit uh, worried about the, uh, the high usage of uh, energy. And uh, well, what Elon Musk said about uh, the problems related to that uh, might be uh, instrumental to what uh, his strategy is. But uh, it is a, uh, certainly true that this is a concern also because I have uh, strong environmental uh, feelings about uh, the possible uh, huge use of uh, energy for Bitcoins. There should be a solution that uh, is environmentally friendly, I would say. Thank you, Massimo. Okay, uh, so we will move on to the next question. So this question is directed to Hawker. Uh, the, the dangers of the poorly regulated crypto market resulted in Turkey's cryptocurrency bus. Um, what are some of the issues surrounding digital assets and how can mass adoption be achieved? Thank you, Mayano. I, I think that's a great question because we're all asking ourselves, you know, how can we create a, a, a safe, trusted environment for this new technology to be just more accepted by people. Um, and I mentioned earlier that we, we've partnered with Australia Post, so we actually um, sort of built these bridges to the, the traditional um, financial system or the, the, the uh, bricks and mortar world really. And, and trust is key here. And again, we, we're hearing, you know, what we're hearing and seeing is often just very, very negative. So it has this image um, um, in, in the public, in the media, um, that cryptocurrency is, is um, you know, um, currency for the criminals. Um, it's using too much energy. Um, there are many scams, um, you know, if you think about um, Bitcoin, ransomware, and so on. Um, and, and that is, you know, all, all of this is factual. It's true. This is happening. Absolutely. But again, it's a mirror of society. Everything that's happening in the in the bricks and mortar world is now digital, and you know the scammers just um, through this have an international business. Um, they can scam people on the other end of the world, and we see that and it's happening. But once again, it's traceable, and um, the tools and law enforcement, the authorities, they are there. Um, um, keeping up, they are they are um, on it, and and we know that obviously because we. Um, we um, we're right in it, right? And and this is a whole new ecosystem and law enforcement is a key player in this as well. And we want the good um, to, um, to be the most important thing here. So I think trust is number one um, for more acceptance of this, um, of this technology. Um, and Bitcoin is just one, we, the, the whole, um, a panel today is about digital assets. Um, we talked about ICOs earlier, um, or, or I, I briefly touched on them as a form of um, alternative capital raising. Um, just, just imagine now you don't have to find a, a broker anymore or a venture capital firm. You can pretty much do it from wherever you are and whatever your background is, you can raise capital from um, like-minded people that believe in you and your idea. Um, and again, here, you know, this has been misused by many to, to do, you know, a money grab. But, uh, and that's part of why this bubble burst in 2017. But um, I think the good things are here to stay. And that's what we have to focus on. And these good things need to be talked about more. And, and eventually the negative things and 
that they, they will be washed out. They will still exist. But again, they exist in the normal world as well. I call it normal world. But they, they do exist as well um, in um, before um, the, the birth of Bitcoin and blockchain. So I think that's really important to know, to put everything into a balance um, and to a perspective. Um, this is largely good. It's what we make out of it. And people are largely good. So um, I, I truly believe that um, with more trust, um, this whole industry um, is going to continue to advance. And eventually, you know, the big trusted companies like the banks will also jump on it. And we see that they are being disrupted by the neo banks, the challenger banks, those already offer cryptocurrencies to their customers. So the big banks and financial institutions, they cannot stay out of this for much longer. Um, so, and, and we're seeing that. So that will create additional trust. Um, that's that's my view. Um, I don't know if other panelists have um, anything to add or um, see it differently. Thank you, Holger. Okay, uh, Tarsen or Massimo? Okay, so we were going to move on to the next question. And this is uh, for Massimo. So how do you see uh, regulations taking shape and what do you expect it will look like for digital assets? I think this is a great question and it's really the focus because uh, whatever is going to happen in the digital space uh, must rely on regulation. And I will give, uh, give you a brief a brief overview of it. In the EU, we have uh, what they call MICA. Uh, in, on September 24, 2020, the EU Commission published a proposal for the regulation of crypto assets, the markets in crypto assets regulation called MICA. And MICA includes all type of crypto assets that are not yet covered by EU financial law. So this also means uh, that security tokens that are already regulated as shares, bonds, do not fall under MICA. Mm. And then uh, there are different categories. Of course, uh, uh, the most interesting ones are ART, ART, and EMT that are basically stable coins, depending on whether they are pegged by a single uh, fiat currency like Euro, US dollar, et cetera, uh, called the EMT, or are linked to a several uh, fiat currencies, commodities such as gold or the value of other crypto assets, and they are called ART. There are also additional requirements if the token is considered significant in brackets, which means, for example, if a broad usage and a large emission volume are expected. Now, the European Parliament uh, published a draft report uh, and with some additional proposals, and uh, these uh, are aimed to grant greater powers to the ECB, European Central Bank, including for it to give binding opinions on white papers, set prudential requirements for certain stable coins issuers, and improve anti-money laundering and financial crime prevention measures. Mm -hmm. then, down, then we pass on to you, uh, uh, United States. In the US, the SEC chairman uh, said that uh, the stronger regulation around crypto exchanges could help protect investors. And that is, uh, this is likely uh, to happen with a dedicated market regulator for the crypto markets, which will be introduced to provide some protection against fraud and manipulation. This is very important especially in the States. Tokens currently on the market that are securities may be offered, sold, and traded in non-compliance with the federal securities laws. In fact, none of the exchange trading crypto tokens has registered yet as a, an exchange with the SEC. This is a very important issue, and this has led to substantially less investor protection and greater opportunities for fraud and manipulation, according to the Fed. Most of the tokens are traded on unre unregistered crypto exchanges. That is why the SEC will be willing to bring enforcement actions against parties that do not comply with the federal securities laws. And then in the US, we have Wyoming, which introduced favorable regulation, and uh, some other states that are more crypto friendly. Now let's come to what is next for the crypto world and uh, for the digital world. In my opinion, it's the DeFi. DeFi, uh, the centralized finance main features, as we all know, 
is that, first of all, it allows people to engage in financial services such as borrowing, lending, and investing. But and this is a very important point. There are no intermediaries like banks. There is a use of blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Uh, it makes uh, DeFi makes the payment more efficient. Example, in international trade, there is no use of correspondent banking. There are some risks, of course, like uh, no accountability. Why? Because uh, being decentralized with functions and power away from a central authority, nobody can be held accountable or take responsibility when something goes wrong in the system. This is a very important point. In fact, every node computer connected to the system makes its own decision. The final result is a collection of the decisions of these individual nodes. But also DeFi transactions are global. If there is a stricter regulatory change in one country, DeFi platforms can move transactions to other countries with, uh, with less strict regulations and avoid previous regulatory uh, changes. And I've been looking at various uh, DeFi projects, and one that uh, struck me is uh, in the UK, actually, it's called Wolves of Wall Street. And this is a UK based DeFi company with some particular features pretty new, and this is uh, why I wanted to mention, because it's focused on innovating the DeFi NFT, non-fungible token space, by focusing on farming and two features of DeFi, which are lending interest and market-making fees. But the interesting thing is that they use crypto folios that can hold NFTs and uh, SFTs, semi-fungible tokens, to earn a yield together with lending and trading features as well. So in fact, you give your NFT, they uh, join them in a, a crypto, portfolio, uh, crypto folio, and you earn a yield together with lending uh, trading features. The visualization of DeFi in the World of Wall Street uh, uh, project is to promote their community to improve accessibility, visualization, and stickiness to DeFi. The interaction and project sustainability is what is really interesting. So all in all, as I said, the regulation is very important to round up. And uh, uh, what's next is DeFi. It's a big thing in the future. Thank you, Massimo. OK, so we will move on to the next question. And after that, we will move on to the participants submitted questions. So this question is uh, directed to the, all the panelists. Uh, we'll start with Massimo, then move on to Torsten, and then Holger. So what is the biggest innovation in crypto, or uh, where do digital assets have the most impact in our view? Well. The biggest innovation, in my opinion, uh, we have to, uh, uh, and also the impact, uh, which is very important, uh, uh, must be understood if we, first of all, uh, clarify when we talk about cryptocurrencies that are permission, centralized cryptocurrencies, which are and, uh, permissionless, decentralized cryptocurrencies. There is a huge difference, uh, as uh, somebody said before of me. First of all, permission that are packed to fiat currency or stable coins, a selected people or institutions have access to it, and there is wider acceptance by financial institutions in short term. Permissionless, everybody can have access to it, like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple. There's immediate use with a broker account, a conversion risk volatility, a wider acceptance by general public. And then there are what I mentioned, the CBDCs. Now, what is uh, uh, the, uh, the advantage of these cryptocurrencies? And uh, the fact is that uh, they give access to online payments for people who do not have access to bank account. This is very important, financial inclusion. All you need is a smartphone, an email address, a mobile wallet, credit balance in the smartphone with cryptocurrencies. So there is no currency fluctuation risk, like in the case of Venezuela currency, but there is a cryptocurrency fluctuation risk. And we're going towards a cashless society, but an increase in financial inclusion, also uh, with the use of CBDCs and digital assets. And also from a practical point of view, Eastern value transfer. This is a revolution in the payment industry because in the old days, there was credit card authorization and settlement 
a system designed in the 70s. Uh, technology was slow and outdated. Now with cryptocurrency, payments are instantaneous. This is great and this is one of the most important advantages. Yeah, um, I, I love everything that that I just heard. Um, uh, for me, there's many interesting innovations going on. Uh, Dogecoin is not one of them. <laughs> I'll be mm -hmm. I'll be very honest. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so some of the points were already mentioned. I mean, uh, Dexis is very interesting. Decentralized exchanges, um, DAOs, and oracles, and all these kind of buzzwords um, and uh, that you hear about when you're in the industry. Um, but maybe just uh, stepping back one, one one thing. So I think since 2009, we've had Bitcoin, right? We've had basically a way uh, uh, money uh, um, that that is. Uh, that cannot be diluted by your um, um, central government or by the central banks, right? No, no more trillions of dollars that are being printed um, out of thin air. So we've had that. Um, Ethereum, maybe, I don't know, six, seven years ago, came up as this whole um, smart contract um, system that which slowly is now emerging into this DeFi, decentralized uh, finance uh, um, world, right? And what is what is so interesting is that it's not only peer-to-peer, -peer, it's not only trustless, right? Um, and, and not only um, a, a scar, so there's, there's value. Um, but what's starting to happen, and I think both Holger and Massimo have, have mentioned it before, is that now um, these protocols and some of these services are actually offering a yield as well, um, uh, which is, in my view, revolutionary, right? So, so why would you... Um, uh, still bank with, with, a, with a bank that you, um, there's a middleman that you need to trust uh, with, with fiat currency that, that you might have an inflation uh, and something where you never ever get any yield. Whereas, you know, when, when, when I um, lend out a um, crypto dollar, a stable coin, I get 7%. In my bank, I get 0.7% if I'm lucky, right? And in my bank, I need a $100,000 minimum balance to get that um, small interest rate. And here in DeFi, um, it's, it's, it's basically no barrier for my first dollar. You can get already that 7% uh, yield. So I think, uh, yeah, very, very interesting times ahead for all of us. Yeah, I, I also totally agree with um, everything that has been said. Um, maybe from an entrepreneurial point of view, um, what I what I observe is that back in 2000, when you know the first or, or earlier, really the, the dot-com boom, the, the first technology companies really emerged, there was, um, at least it looked to me like, um, you need a lot of capital. You needed to be quite techy, um, and and it was it was difficult with the limited technology we had. Um, but now, you know, even even ten years on after that, um, you you have technology broken down. Um, everyone can now participate. Everyone from their smartphone even can start a business, um, and then it's a global business because you can load upload an app into the app store, and your life and selling in hundred countries. But now with, with cryptocurrency, blockchain, digital assets, it's moving so fast, there's going to be so much more. Um, now we're breaking down financial systems as well. And Massimo mentioned um, financial inclusion. So there's nothing that can stop me or you or anyone you know, to issue a digital currency from their phone right now. So breaking down technology, breaking down finance, and allowing everyone, the smartest people in the world to participate and, and to make a change. And we don't have to talk about building billion dollar companies. This can be just a small change for anyone in the world, whatever money means to them um, or, or value, store of value, whatever that is, you know, that can be their daily job, just changing that if it's a farm worker somewhere in Africa. Um, this is now possible and everyone can participate. And that's why the pace of this technology, and you've heard um, so many buzzwords today, most of that only came into place in the last two years, I would even think. Um, the pace is so fast and it will continue to be so fast because everyone participates. It's been broken down so much. That is super exciting. It's a bit scary. Um, and, and these rallies happen out of that but it's super exciting. And that's for me the, the biggest innovation. Thank you, Holger, Thorsten and Massimo. Uh, so uh, great discussions. Now we will move on to audience submitted questions. A lot of questions were submitted by our participants during registration. Uh, a few of them have already been addressed through our discussion. So the first question um, is, uh, uh, 
directed to all our panelists, uh, and we will start with Holger, then Massimo, and then Torsten. The question is, what drives the volatility of uh, cryptocurrencies, and will they become less volatile as the as they gain broader acceptance and use? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's a great question um, because that is sort of what we see these these um, this high volatility and that always creates headlines um, and greed and and I think headlines and greed are are not good um, for for what we want to create because this is supposed to be a long term asset that helps us the way we live, the way we work, the way we travel. Um, there's so many things we can do with this and volatility is maybe good for purely financial instruments, but not for the greater good, the underlying technology and intention. And um, I believe that um, we need to take that out of this whole space. Um, and there are many, many assets and, and companies that are working on these long-term projects. And that is really exciting. That's, that's you know, we've, we've um, if, if people think about investing in this space, I think there is um, a much more longer term value proposition here. Uh, a company like ours, for example, we are the picks and shovels of this gold rush. It's the infrastructure, the on-ramp and the off-ramp. And, and that is, I believe, where the underlying value is long term. Um, while um, short term, if you want to trade, you know, you have to follow the headlines um, and um, pretty much be on it 24 seven um, because a tweet by Elon Musk can move the market so much. And that is just something you cannot anticipate. There's no reason why a, a currency would, would move or yeah, a digital asset would move after a tweet. Um, and I think um, like you super have to be in it um, to, to stay on top of it. It's 24 seven, it doesn't sleep. Um, so that that can't be good. Um, so it's really what we should focus on is is the long term projects, the infrastructure, um, and everything else is just noise, which might help with adoption. But there is no get rich quick. You can get poor very quickly, usually much quicker as well. Um, so yeah, be be careful. Um, okay. <laughs> over to you guys. Okay, I like this question because it's very important to understand the crypto space. I would say a few things. First of all, the large swings in the price of Bitcoin and other digital coins are here to stay. The change in traditional investing is also explained by alternative data. Why? Because investing environment nowadays is mainly populated by young retail investors who act differently. Institutional money though, is starting to follow their conversations in order to get ahead of the, their collective influence. Even smart money is starting to embrace the relative freedom of young investing. This is uh, one important point. Now, a few numbers to understand the, uh, the, this phenomenon, the principles of crypto investing. First of all, the market value of cryptocurrencies have plunged uh, about 1 trillion from the peak of, uh, of some 2.6 trillion this month in May, 2021, over half of the 410 billion spent on acquiring current Bitcoin holdings occurred in the last 12 months, half. Of it. About 110 billion of that was spent on buying it at an average cost of less than $36,000 per coin. That means that the vast majority of investments are making a profit unless the coin trades above $36,000. So Bitcoin was trading uh, uh, recently just above that, but still well down from the mid-April uh, record of almost uh, $65,000. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, the principle of crypto investing, this is what I, I, I say to my clients, are few principles but to follow. First of all, invest just a small percentage of your total assets, let's say between 10 and 15%, depending on your risk attitude. Be ready to lose a high percentage of it. If you decide, however, to buy a crypto assets, stay in it for a while. Day trading can cause huge losses. And fourth, you need a vision of the asset you're buying. 
no different from traditional investing. I love that advice, uh, word for word. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to add a little bit of uh, color on the side, but yeah, 100% right. Also, what, what, what Holger said about the short-term trading, I mean, um, uh, I know a few people who try short-term uh, trading, most of them lose money. It's, it's impossible um, to do that. Um, and uh, on the long-term basis, this volatility almost doesn't really matter, right? Um, because um, um, whether I, I bought it in, I, I don't know, I'm making up these numbers now, uh, January 2015 or July 2015, there might be a 300% difference. But looking at it from you know five years or six years uh, different, it, it doesn't matter anymore. So the, the, uh, the one other approach, uh, if you want to invest in this digital gold um, um, uh, investment thesis, is just to add up little bits of Bitcoin every day, every week, every month, how, however uh, much, and then you just increase your position. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, one Bitcoin is still one Bitcoin, right? Uh, so so you want to increase that position and, and, um, and don't get nervous when the market is crashing. In fact, you might think, oh, that's a good time to maybe uh, buy a little bit more. Um, and then um, on, on this investment thesis, obviously, I mean, this is highly volatile, highly risky. Um, uh, all these small altcoins, even more so than Bitcoin, and even Bitcoin can lose 50% of its value. Um, but think of it as um, Amazon um, 20 years ago, right? Um, in, in Seattle, um, you, you could have made that bad. Well, Amazon might be the leading player in e-commerce um, and it dominate the whole world. Very risky. In fact, that stock lost 90% of its value twice during the history, right? And um, with Bitcoin, maybe, maybe it's a different bet, totally different, right? Is it digital gold or not? Not, will it work out? But think of it as a 10-year, 20-year uh, time horizon. I think you'll do fine. And uh, believe me, you won't worry about this little volatility um, today or the last week. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Torsten, uh, Massimo, and Holger. Uh, just to clarify, the previous question was submitted by Todd Mansell. So the next question submitted by Mark Demetropoulos and directed to Massimo. So do you see USA moving to digital currency to replace the paper dollar within the next five to seven years? Yeah, this is a great question and many people ask me all the time. So I, I would give you a bit of a background to understand what's happening in that, because that is quite important. First of all, in my opinion, there are two models for CBDCs, digital money. The one-tier model, digital money is to be transferred directly from the central bank by the social security system to a single person, directly. The social security system holds all the updated information of the persons. Because of COVID-19, the money transfers to be done in the US to the people who need them, mostly unemployed people, could be done directly uh, with digital currency transfers from the government via the social security system to them. These direct payments by the blockchain allow the money to go fast to the people according to their updated information. Then we have a two-tier system, two-tier model, digital money to be transferred to intermediaries, mostly banks, to a single person. That's a model to be adopted in China, proposed in the US, and in all uh, other countries. Banks, however, are not much in favor of the introduction of a digital currency because they would suffer the most if the one-tier system is adopted in the longer term. However, the companies worst off because of the introduction of digital currency will be the likes of Visa and MasterCard. The processing of transactions in the future will not need credit cards, but only digital currency wallets. Now, uh, let's come in uh, to US. There is the Digital Dollar Project, which is a partnership between the Digital Dollar Foundation and Accenture to advance the exploration of a digital dollar. The main features is the two-tier model, as we said. A digital dollar will be a tokenized form of the US dollar. The U a digital dollar will operate alongside existing fiat currency and commercial bank money. And also digital dollar will be distributed through the existing two-tier architecture of commercial banks and regulated intermediaries. So a digital dollar will not impact the Federal Reserve's ability to affect monetary policy and control inflation. But for uh, the introduction of CBDCs is positive for consumers. Why? Because uh, some panelists told me, uh, told before me, uh, they, uh, in the current interest rate environment, the only advantage of having a bank account is that it enables digital payments because of no interest remuneration. 
There are, however, many costs related to having a bank account, especially for every single transaction done. And also lower security because of breaches from hackers. And also fees to be paid for electronic transaction using credit cards. So in fact, uh, finally the, the answer, digital currency in the US in seven years from now, the decision is political. On one side, there are pressures from lobbying groups from, of the financial sector, which uh, prefer the tier two model to be slowly and slowly adopting the model in the US. On the other side, there's a pressure not to be behind the China in CBDCs. Fed says better later, but well done than sooner. I have a, a, a lot of friends in the Fed and uh, we had long discussions about this issue. I believe my opinion is that the US will be adopting the digital dollar within the next five to seven years, but will not replace the paper dollar. It will be a mixed adoption by US citizens. The, as we said, uh, this is a, a news, a recent news, DM, US stable coin is only intended as an interim step until the US Fed issues a central bank digital currency or digital dollar. This is a statement that was made recently. That is uh, uh, to say that uh, we, have, uh, we are going towards that option, but uh, the consumers in the US should uh, feel and be stronger about the adoption of CBDCs because they will be in advantage uh, because of that adoption. Thank you, Massimo. Torsten, you wanted to add something? Yeah. Um... Look, I, I'm, I'm no expert, uh, Massimo clearly is, um, but I'm, I'm wondering whether this is the right question. Um, it kind of uh, reminds me of someone asking um, 25 years ago, will the internet replace telecommunications wires? Will the World Wide Web replace newspapers? Um, I mean, yeah, maybe I mean, you could argue that, but, but that's not the point. I mean, this, this, this technology is way more powerful, has many more applications. We've talked about a few of them. Uh, in my film, Cryptopia, um, I also highlight um, half a dozen um, uh, you know, use cases, things that were not really possible before. So um, just the replacing is, isn't really that interesting. I mean, I, we, let's talk about audio, right? Right? Is Spotify replacing radio? Is the CD replacing? I mean, does that really matter? Or are we talking about a much, much bigger and more ambitious vision? Thank you, Tarsen. Uh, Holger, uh, any comments? No, nothing to add. I think that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thank you, guys. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So the next question was submitted uh, by Bill Paceman, uh, and, uh, directed to Tarsen. Uh, how valid is the thesis that an investment in crypto is an investment in the black economy? Yeah, tricky one, right? Uh, something that uh, Bit Bitcoiners um, and, and don't like to maybe talk about. Um, there's a little bit of um, um, nervousness in the room. So let me just address it um, straight on. Um, look, there's no doubt about it. Let's not whitewash history. Um, and, and the, the whole um, a Bitcoin, uh, the first two, three, four years of it was largely driven by drug uh, markets and by illegal uh, black markets on the internet. Um, no doubt about it. Um, but as Holger rightly said earlier, and in, in my film, I have, I have a, um, a sequence about this as well, is um, the blockchain also makes everything trackable and traceable. Uh, everything is public for everyone to see. That's what a blockchain is, right? Um, so in fact, um, the um, Bitcoin didn't, didn't only enable drug lords uh, and drug buyers to kind of, uh, you know, buy and sell, but it also enabled um, the, the, the cops who tried to steal some of that money to be caught. Uh, so so um, um, it is, it is uh, you know, always um, uh, good and bad, so to speak. And there have been a, a few um, studies. I don't know the exact number now, but actually I, I looked at a documentary um, just last week that said that about 99% of all money in offshore havens. So, you know, the, those uh, Bahamas and uh, Bermudas and uh, Isle of Man, 99% of all uh, money in those is kind of illicit. It's, it's kind of gray. <laughs> I, I don't know whether that's true, but it's a huge amount, right? And we also know that the traditional banking system is used by a huge 
huge amount um, uh, for money laundering, right? I mean, all the major banks, all the major banks have been penalized and fined for very, very bad, um, 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 you know, uh, crimes, basically, including financing terrorism and, and financing and drug lords. And the same is true for crypto, no, no doubt. I don't know what the number is, maybe one or two percent. Um, but I think it's just one relatively small use case um, for crypto and um, especially for crypto uh, cr cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, where the blockchain is kind of public and um, you need to have your um, uh, you know, proper registration. So in order to buy Bitcoin from Holger, you need to actually show your um, ID, right? At his a a company or finance that uses his company in the background. So it is kind of getting more and more difficult. But there's other cryptocurrencies, um, privacy coins that are much better at hiding your identity, um, but um, investment case, I don't think so. Thank you, Tarsan. Uh, Holger, Massimo, would you like to add? Yeah, I, I tend I, to agree. Uh, uh, sorry, Massimo, you go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Holger. I, I just want to say I, I tend to agree because, again, the you know these are all stories um, that that people pay attention to, um, rightly so. Um, you know, it, it it sounds like a movie, and um, the negative will always have a heavier weighting on the news in the media than the positive. Um, but if you actually look into, you know, the, the industry publications, for example, Coindesk um, is sort of the, um, the media platform um, with all the news about cryptocurrency, blockchain, and so on. Um, they have overwhelmingly positive um, news about this whole space. And there will always be bad actors. But I think it's really sad for all those entrepreneurs, all those market participants like us, that we, we get dragged into that. Um, it will eventually wash out and, and um, have the right balance like it has in the real world. Um, but it's a process. And um, because it's skyrocketed so much and so unnaturally, um, you know, these, these things are just happening. It's just the normal, uh, I think, um, evolution of this rapid technology. And, and you just hear these stories um, that are absolutely unthinkable 10 years ago where people just became so rich or so poor or scammed or all that. Um, it's, everything is extreme and we need to sort of level it out again um, and it will happen over time. Um, for everyone out there, be careful um, because um, I think everyone's in charge of their own finances and um, you know there are great opportunities here but with, like with everything else, it, it, a long-term view is, is probably um, the most important um, and, and really the deep understanding of the things that we, that we do. Um, and that gives me personally all the confidence that I'm doing the right thing. Um, and um, whenever my dad sends me a negative article about crypto, I'm now very, very confident that um, you know I've, I've contributed to good things in this space and, and I continue to do so just like everyone else here. Um, Massimo, over to you. Yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, something that is related to this issue, but is very important. And uh, especially for people who get into crypto, but do not have a, a clear feeling about the importance of private keys. Many people ask me about that, uh, and many people uh, do not have a full understanding of that. My statement is always the same. I say, if you lose private keys, you lose all your crypto assets forever. Why? Because private keys are the most important thing of characters. They give them the right to own execute crypto transactions on the wallet. If you lose the private keys, you lose the ownership rights of your wallets forever. It is not possible to reset the private keys as one can do it in a password security system. In fact, there are some examples and many people ask about that. For instance, there is this German born programmer, Stefan Thomas, who has just two guesses left to figure out a password that is worth about $220 million. And another important thing is that out of the existing 18.5 million Bitcoins, about around 20% worth about $140 billion appear to be lost or otherwise stranded wallets because private keys were lost. That's why uh, people, as somebody said, people should be their own bank and hold their own money. So, uh, so what are the basic principles about private keys? 
First of all, select the right wallet with the proper security features. Call the wallet is the most secure, uh, secure way to store your cryptocurrencies. Paper or hardware wallet are what they are referred as called wallets. They cannot be hacked since they are offline. And also, a strong two-factor authentication method is vital when it comes to securing uh, your wallet and your cryptocurrencies. This is why from time to time you see that uh, so ma many wallets are not unused. And uh, uh, I'm sure everybody in, the, in this panel knows about that. Thank you, Massimo. Uh, so uh, we are actually ready to wrap up now. On behalf of Harvard in Tax Seattle, thank you for your time today. Our panelists, uh, Holger, uh, Massimo, Trosten, uh, thank you. It is a great pleasure to have you uh, as our panelists. It was an informative session and we have learned a lot. To the participants, uh, thank you for joining us today. It is remarkable how significantly all of our lives have changed over the past year. We hope you and your loved ones are staying safe and healthy, getting vaccinated during the COVID-19. We are grateful for the connections and strength of the Harvard alumni community. Thanks for your generosity and support. Hope this webinar will bring in some thought-provoking discussion. If you are interested in learning more, please join us at Harvard in Tech Seattle. Uh, thank you and goodbye for now. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks Bye. all for joining. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mayna. Thank you. Thank you.